Bum, bum, bum. That is our new intro song. Welcome back to Meaningful People Podcast. I'm Yaakov Linger. And I'm Nachi Gordon. And this week we have a very interesting, amazing, holy person. Deep individual. Who, I, I don't know how you first heard about him. I first heard about him through Twitter. How about you? I think he was on the cover of Mishbacha. Yeah. I could be mixing him up. If he wasn't, he should be. If he wasn't, he should be. He's a deep individual. It'll be Joey Rosenfeld, living all the way out there in St. Louis, Missouri, doing holy work. Um, but we got him here in our office yeah. for a beautiful conversation. We were working on getting him for a while, but he's just he was just so busy back there. Back there? And that's not like he's not in the backyard or something. I think it's in the Midwest, yeah. Yeah, he's there, <laughs> but he came in and we got to get to know who he is, what he's up to. And you get to know a lot more about Hasidus because he's so connected he's to dead. it. And um, you could just see it in his eyes when, he, when he's giving shirim, when he speaks. Like sometimes look at his eyes and his eyes are just like up. You yeah. know, he's, I, he's connected to a higher source. If you haven't heard, if you haven't listened to any of his shirim, definitely go check them out after you get to know a little more about Rav Joey. But either way, enjoy the rest of this episode. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast where we talk to people who are meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. We're sitting here with Rabbi Joey Rosenfeld, fresh off a plane from St. Louis. Thank you so much for coming in, Please. just especially for this, right? A <laughs> uh, couple of shirim, but thank you so much for uh, for having me. It's really a, a schluss. We were just talking before, you're originally from this part of town. Yes, I grew up a couple of blocks away from here on Elm Street. So I grew up in, well, originally I grew up in Cedarhurst, 523 Albemarle Road. And then we moved to Elm Street when I was in high school. But yeah, Woodmere, Cedarhurst is uh, where I spent my whole life. So these are your old stomping grounds. You, you, Central you, Avenue. You used to That's run exactly these streets, right. huh? Yeah, Motzei Shabbos by Dave's Pizza. Oh, you're giving away the <laughs> secrets now. <laughs> so so what, what would you say your childhood was like? Were, were you Rav Joey back then? <laughs> no, by no means. Um, my childhood was wonderful. I had really, really wonderful parents. Um, one of four boys. So I had an older brother who was able to kind of show me the ropes a little bit, and then younger brothers who I was able to blame other things on. <laughs> um, but it was a wonderful childhood. You know, I went to Halb Elementary School, DRS High School. Um, I grew up davening at Rabbi Spiegel Stiebel, where I think uh, that was my first taste of real Hamish, really? you know, Judaism, especially the the oily cholent and like the kugel. <laughs> um, and then also growing up in the vicinity of Rav Weinberger and Eish Kodesh was, uh, was a major, major benefit for me. But childhood was childhood was good. You know, modern, orthodox, stable, you know, what we come to know of as Americanized Judaism. So it was really, uh, it was wonderful. And so I'm curious, I mean, like right now, it's hard, a little hard to define, and you probably don't like labels, but it's a little hard to define like who you are, what you are, like what you're up to, like you're spreading so much panemius atira. But like, my question is- yeah, how, It sounds like that was the first time you ever said the word panemius. Is it? <laughs> it that probably, the first, yeah. I think it was I the first time you ever said that word. The inner sides of the taira. <laughs> so it's like, at what point did you have that shift? So the, the shift, well, I went to high school where I was interested in, in depth. You know, I was reading um, existentialists and I was listening to The Grateful Dead and The Doors and paying attention to the lyrics and reading the books about the singers. And then I went to OJ uh, for two years, which was incredible. Primarily, one of the most essential parts was lo location. So kind of in Har Yehuda, situated in a place outside of you know, the hustle and bustle of Yerushalayim. And it's I very learned, far from town. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and we learned, um, I, I learned silence there. I learned what it meant to be outside with myself. And I also learned how to read Hebrew, which was probably the most important thing I did in Eretz Yisrael. And then really nothing took shape when I was in Israel. And then when I came back, I went to Landers where I started learning the Maharal. Um, and that was an opening for me. That kind of just became... I finally felt, oh, wow, these are the ideas that I've been thinking about, grappling with, struggling with, and and here this book is kind of like medicine. And, and so that's when I finally dove into it. Was that something that was like self-motivated self, uh, or was it a, someone at Landers? Or? It was self-motivated always. There were always different teachers or people who kind of introduced me to these ideas, but it was never, it was never directed study. Um, but thankfully we live in a generation where the books are self-explanatory. So I bought the books and I started finding my way through them. 
And the cool thing about Landers was that nobody was really bothering me. Um, so I was able to kind of sit and do what I wanted to do. And I slowly but surely just began to understand a little bit more of Panimiya Satora or the inner teachings of Torah. You say Panimiya well. Yeah. <laughs> for the first time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's marketing. Um, <laughs> and then slowly but surely, I just had, I went through different stages, kind of step by step of different interests and different forms of Torah. But it, so it was really very much uh, autodidactic or, or self-taught. You know, I'm, I'm by, by no means a student uh, of any sort. You know, I, I struggle as a student, but I was able to, to read. And that was really where I began to really be interested in it. Well, what do you mean you said like with OJ, you're able to be outside in the space? It, well, what, do you, what do you mean by that? I had never experienced kind of this expansivity that the air of Eretz Yisrael offers a person. Meaning I went to summer camps and I went to Masora and I had a wonderful time there. But there was never really a sense of being outside and the outside itself being significant. And, and the air in, in Jerusalem, the air in Eretz Yisrael, just offered a different type of feeling. It allowed a person to be on their own without being with other people. And I would kind of skip out of morning Seder and wander up the mountains to the caves that they have there and just kind of walk around and, and practice before I knew what it actually was, was just really talking to myself in my own language and ultimately beginning to try and talk to Hashem in my own language. And so it was really there that I found this ability to make a decision that, okay, this thing that I grew up with, Judaism, Torah, mitzvot, which I always kept, but by by means of just, it was, it was easy, but there was no depth or significance necessarily. And then in Israel, it really dawned on me that, okay, this is, you know, this is going to be a path where these things become the essential parts of a person's life. So I think, I mean, I credit it to the air there. There's a <laughs> story goes by a certain tzaddik of Usher Freund, who was an incredible, incredible person. But he said that Beit Meir, where OJ is located, and NCSY Kolo too, is where David HaMelech wrote some of Tehillim. So the air there is already kind of open to, to breaking a person down. That's so nice. So you, you get back to America, you're in Landers. Well, what, what are you going for at that point? I had always known that I was interested in psychology. Um, I, I didn't know exactly what type of psychology I was interested in. I didn't necessarily know which direction I wanted to take it in, but I knew that I wanted to do psychology. And I also knew that saying I would do smicha would be the way to get you know, my parents to let me learn a little bit more. <laughs> um, so I tried doing the smicha thing um, and I did it for a little bit, um, although I did not find what I was looking for. And then in Landers was amazing in the sense that educationally it was wonderful, but it gave you a lot more room to just wiggle around and do what you wanted to do. It wasn't impossible to just spend a lot of time in the base medrash. And I kind of tripped my way through, you know, passing the classes I needed to pass, reading the books I needed to read, um, but really just kind of creating my own curriculum that I was going through there. And I met wonderful Rebbeim there, Rabbi Bamberger, who's the ma mashkiach there. I had the source of learning by Rav Branspiegel and Rav Parnas. So really giants, you know, students of Rav Soloveitchik and people who you would bring up Rav Soloveitchik's name in Rav Branspiegel's class and he would start crying. So <laughs> you began to realize that also these ideological differences that people were speaking of at the time were kind of false and, and really not real. Um, but there were numerous times where I was caught in his Gemara Shir with like Rav Tzadok under my Gemara. And he's like, he would just shrug his shoulders. He's like, all right, you know, <laughs> like, I'm not going to bother you if you don't bother me. So, <laughs> so Landers was really a, a, a special place for me. I was able to do my own thing. Wow. I think a, a lot of people also know you for your Twitter handle yeah, and your presence on there, which, you know, you, you spread a lot of uh, goodness. When, when did that start? How has that experience been? And what has it done for your life? Yeah, so I think Twitter started in 2015. I've tried a few times to go back to see my first tweet, and I haven't been successful in kind of doing that. Um, you know how many tweets you have? If you something have to like 10,000. For real? I think something like that. That's a number I just saw recently, which is a little bit... Uh, it wasn't upsetting to me. It was just like, wow, I've spent a lot of time on this forum. <laughs> right, like a book um, was just off your tweets. Let's see. Yeah, what I can 10, say 000. about the tweets is that there's a lot of thought that goes into them. Um, sometimes wow. it's a, 11, a tweets. culmination, a culmination of, of years of thinking about something, and that becomes kind of the quintessence of the idea. Or sometimes it's just something I'm randomly thinking about in the middle of, you know, work or, you know, at home. Um, but... I have found it to be a base medrash for myself, where I was able to share ideas that I wanted to share, having always had a sense that what I was thinking 
was something that other people might enjoy, not because it's my own thoughts, but because I uncovered kind of for myself these teachings of our tzaddikim, older generations, and I said, wow, this is profoundly relevant. Um, and I said, people, people would appreciate to know this. So I found a way of sharing it in shorthand and trying to be evocative, sometimes having a counterintuitive twist to it. But ultimately, it's become just a process of sharing Torah. Over time, there were times where there was wonderful chavrusaship and, and introducing new ideas to new people and meeting new people, academics, teachers. Slowly but surely, it's become more of a cesspool. You know, I, I have a harder and harder time finding, you know, benefits over there. But well, I do my thing and then I kind of just shut off. I typically don't respond to people, which is my own flaw or my own benefit. I'm not sure, but I just use it as a space to share ideas. And I think that it's been really, really beneficial for me. And A, getting my name out there and getting these ideas more recognized and B, just kind of being a space to share what I feel I want to share. Riff Cook has a, has a statement. He says that all anger comes from the inability to express spiritual creativity. So there are times where if I have an idea and I want to share it and I have no way of sharing it, so then it becomes just frustrated and it becomes kind of stuck inside. So if for nothing else, it gives me an ability to kind of find catharsis to the ideas and just place them into cyberspace. Well, so when you, when you say these ideas, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I kind of feel like there's something in specific that you might be referring to. If you were to, I guess, boil down these ideas to a specific topic or one mm -hmm. singular idea, what would that be? The, the framework that I would place it in now is Panimiya Satora, basically meaning the inner teachings of Torah. Um, but it's really not reserved to any specific content of idea, but rather a form of an idea. Meaning there's the externalized expression of an idea, and then there's the ability to look inwards and to see what does this mean for me at this particular moment? How, how does this idea benefit me in my life right now? So... Panimiya Sator for me is taking from anywhere, whether it's the Balei Musr, whether it's the Mekubalim, whether it's the Balei Hasidus, the students of the Vilna Gon, contemporary thinkers, and really trying to condense it into a bite-sized manageable piece of information that can have a practical effect on the way we live our lives in this world. Can you give an example of, of something that you would share? With? Sure, so, so an example would be so, Let's say the Arizal develops the whole idea of the concealment of Hashem for the sake of creating the world, right? So an idea called Simpsum, which has been written about and spoken about for generations upon generations, thousands of pages written on it. So if I'm thinking about that idea and a particular element of it speaks to me, so I'll say something that concealment is in truth the site of discovering the deepest element of Hashem's light which on a practical level, and I could only speak for myself, is living in a world where concealment is the name of the game. And again, concealment also has to be translated. Concealment can mean anxiety, it can mean loneliness, it can mean a sense of wandering or listlessness or laziness or feeling down about oneself. I believe that all of those, when properly understood, are direct and clear translations of what these ideas are meant to mean. And so recognizing that these ideas can impact the way we look at the struggle in our lives and we allow ourselves to find presence of Hashem there. So I think that that's, uh, that's medicine, you know, it becomes medicine for, for myself at least and anybody who's willing to listen. I, I want to get back into that idea like Tyra is medicine, but um, you're for sure the type of person who's like anti-labels, but I see you, you came in with a Rabbi Nachman, Breslov Sefer. Are, would you say you're Breslov? Are you Hasidish? Are you Modox? <laughs> what, what? So, so I'm certainly Hasidish in the sense that before the war, before World War II, um, my family, my father's family in particular, stems from Satmar Hasidus. Mm. And um, at that stage, there was a very close relationship between Rav Yoelish and my great-grandfather, Rav David Rosenfeld. Um, after the war, my great-grandfather and my namesake, Rav Yoelish, who was my Saba's younger brother, were Neherag al Kedesh Hashem. So they were killed in Auschwitz. And my Saba was Mutzal Me'esh. He was saved from that place, but he did not come out unscathed with his relationship to Hasidus. Um, in particular, ideas about tzaddikim and, and uh, long, important ideas and concepts. Um, but the blood is Hasidish. It's, it's Satmar, it's Vizhnitz. But my upbringing, both from my grandparents and my parents, is modern Orthodox. 
you know, and not just modern Orthodox on a cultural level, Rav Soloveitchik and, and ideas from Heschel and, and all of the significant Talmidei Chachamim that modern Orthodoxy has kind of created were deeply respected. And it's one of the places where I learned to respect for language and a respect for the way ideas are expressed and not simply what they mean. And what I have experienced, thankfully, and I know I'm not alone in this phenomenon, but many of us who grew up in a modern Orthodox context are now returning back to the light of the Baal Shem Tov from our great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents, but we're approaching it with the tools and the, the vessels or the kalim of modern Orthodoxy, which is uh, an appreciation for language, an appreciation for expressing ideas in a certain way that they should be coherent and aligned with kind of modern sensibilities. And I think that it's created, the, the phrase that gets used all the time and I have no association with is neo-Hasidic, mm -hmm. um, you know, because the idea neo-Hasidic means something very specific, historically speaking. Um, but it's, I think it's, I think we're students of the Baal Shem Tov and we're just kind of, so I would consider myself Hasidic, that's for sure. Um, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov is certainly uh, the crown jewel of, of any Torah that I try and learn. Um, I used to think that I had to be a breast lover in the sense that all I could study was Rabbi Nachman, and it was hard to study anything else. And then I slowly but surely came to realize that connecting to Rabbi Nachman doesn't mean only learning Rabbi Nachman. It means learning everything through the lens of how Rabbi Nachman would want the person to study Torah, which is that it should have a direct impact on the way that you function in the day-to-day -day life as, as well as the moment-to-moment -moment experience. So that has opened me up to being able to study anything. We found the Gon, the students of the Gon. Um, I had a Slobodka stage. I had, you know, a Maskilim stage. So I've been through a lot of stages, but I seem to have settled very much by Rabbi Nachman, especially his stories. So more on, uh, I guess, professional level, what is it that you currently do in St. Louis? I am an LCSW, so I'm a therapist and I work in a treatment center, a substance abuse treatment center. So for people struggling from any type of addiction, primarily alcoholism, heroin addiction, methamphetamine addiction, whatever issue there might be. And like any inpatient facility, there are groups that are run, so educational groups, and then there's individual counseling. So I've been working in the same place, the Harris House Foundation for six years now since I arrived in St. Louis. And what I found is that I was able to run these groups utilizing the ideas that I have been thinking about and studying for so long. Um, so instead of saying Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says, I would say a 17th century Ukrainian mystic Naman <laughs> says. Or instead of saying Rav Yerucham Levavitz says, I would say Leibowitz's theory of self. Or, you know, this is Schneerson's theory of desire. And the clients who are really working with clients in addiction is a really easy place to test out the value of ideas because these individuals are on the one hand so broken and so down to the ground that they are in search of anything. They are trying to grab hold of any insight that provides hope or comfort. And what I have found over and over again is that the teachings of our tradition are, are just gold to them. You know, stories from Rabbi Nachman, teachings from the Kutzka Rebbe. You know, I, I had a client once who, um, who, who relapsed and came back after having relapsed on heroin. And he came to find me and he says, you know, I got to tell you, I was out there and I was really ready to let it go. But I remembered what Nachman had said. And Nachman said that even when a person feels that they've lost hope, there's no such thing as losing hope. And he said, that's what pushed me to kind of persevere and come back in. Wow. So here I am in 2021, St. Louis, Missouri, where people have never really seen a Jew, let alone known about what Judaism is. And, um, and I'm finding that the words of our tzaddikim are just as relevant and as therapeutic as, as they would be for us. Do you, do you see a correlation? Like, obviously, you're dealing with people that are really, really, you know, very tough times in their life. They're trying to get out of something that they're in. Mm -hmm. But in, in a way, you could say they're broken. Do you, do you see... In, in our lives, just people who aren't struggling with addiction, that they're broken in, in a way? So I'm biased in this. Okay. My, my bias is that I think everybody is broken, um, but I don't think being broken is a symptom of not being good enough. I think being broken is, the word I like to use is constitutive of being human, meaning it's the very birthplace of being a human being. 
And that just as Hashem, as we're taught, created the world through acts of concealment and then shattering, so too our experiences come about through acts of concealment and shattering. So the goal is not to be perfect. The goal is to own our brokenness, own our imperfections, and find a way to serve Hashem, not in spite of our imperfections, but specifically through our imperfections. And in that way, we're bringing this world back up to God, so to speak. So I think that brokenness is a precondition for human experience. The real question is, to what degree do we recognize our brokenness? Or phrased differently in a, le- in a more kind of clinical sense, to what degree does our brokenness interfere with our ability to function? Hmm. So there's a famous teaching, and I, I bring this teaching up very often, a famous teaching from the Kutzker Rebbe. And the Kutzker Rebbe would say that there's nothing as whole as a broken heart. Right, which is a somewhat paradoxical counterintuitive statement because brokenheartedness seems to be a negative thing that a person experiences. But in truth, the way different tzaddikim have interpreted this is that when a person falls apart in their own relative way, so then they begin to realize that, okay, I'm not as whole as I thought I was. And once I'm able to acknowledge my inherent brokenness and the fact that I'm not whole, I can then begin to pick up the pieces and I can look at the pieces individually and I could come to understand myself in a much deeper way. As opposed to someone who walks around thinking everything is great, how cold there, everything is perfect, so they'll never have to break themselves open to look at themselves. So I've always liked to say that if the Kutzgrabi says that there's nothing more whole than a broken heart, the inverse is also true, that there's nothing more broken than a whole heart. Hmm. Meaning one of the more pathetic things to go through life doing is thinking that how cold to say there, everything is perfect, everything is fine, I don't need to break myself open and pick myself up again. That's awesome. Do you, do you think that like in today's times, we live in that fakeness more that we think everything's fine and we just go go with that? I mean, to, up until Corona, maybe. Um, <laughs> I think that nowadays people have, have come to a recognition that human beings are, are somewhat powerless. You know, I always say to my clients who are in recovery and kind of working with 12-step ideas, and I'm saying that you guys are the most well-prepared to deal with this because you've never expected perfection or power anyway you've come to a place of realizing that we're not in control and now i think most people are clamoring for that type of wisdom the wisdom of acceptance and mindfulness and just a willingness to find the self in spite of the difficulty but i do think there is somewhat of an overcompensation to make things perfect because perfectionism let's say as a as a category of human experience is really not because a person feels that they deserve to be perfect. It's more that a person is so terrified of what imperfection implies that they will spend all of their energy and waking hours making sure that everything looks perfect. So everybody is worried about that crack that kind of exists underneath the facade of of human functionality because we're terrified about what it means for us, what it means about our delicate egos, what it means about our successes in life. And I think that a major thing missing in a person's life like that is is the experience of what it means to be human, which is in fact to be broken, you know, and to be, to, to struggle to find meaning as opposed to being born into meaning. It's so funny you say that because my wife always gets upset. Whenever I share something on WhatsApp status or Instagram story, like people only see one side. It's like, you know, maybe 1%, not even of my life. And people like come over and- Hope it's not 1% of your life. No, I'm not- It's a big chunk of Insta stories. Okay, yeah, sorry, (laughs) 0.04%. And and my wife always gets upset. Like, this isn't reality. Like, yeah, it's a small component, but like everyone's seeing like a falsehood. And and it's true. I I kind of try to sheer- It's the issue with social media in general. I know, I know, but it's it's Mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying of of people Mm -hmm. just sharing- The highlights. Yeah. It's sharing the highlights and, and human beings have a very natural need for acknowledgement. And we tend to live our own codependent lives. You know, codependency is not simply something relegated to addicts and alcoholics. We live vicariously through the acknowledgement of other people. And so social media has made that kind of instantaneous, um, that a person can put something out there that represents themselves in a way that they would like to be seen. And then there's this instant response of acknowledgement, good, good, like, like, you know, which means, okay, you're doing great and share it more. Um, the problem with that is that, A, it, it's not necessarily that it's falsehood, but it's, it's simply one stroke of the colors that make up the, the picture of life. Um, you know, I don't think the answer is to share all the failures either, but the, the, process, the process needs to be more vulnerable. We have to be able to accept the fact that life is more often than not messy, chaotic, um, disrupted, 
And and the problem is that we we think that's bidi evid and it's not. That that's just the way things are in in this world. And the job is my favorite word is to be mitmodeid, to face it, to contemplate it, to stare at it unflinchingly instead of running away into some falsehood of of perfection. That's a really nice answer. So you you put out a lot of Tyra and and a lot of thoughts on Tyra. What what's what are some Tyras? I sound so crazy this episode. <laughs> what are some what are some Torah thoughts that that are thoughts. are deep in, in your head that you like talking about sharing? So I would say the the point that I always like to make is is number one, there's a real misnomer with regards to what happened with Adam and Chava in Gan Eden. Um, Let's delve right in. What happened? <laughs> well, I don't know what happened, but I can tell you what didn't happen. <laughs> uh, you know, the notion is that Adam and Chava operated on a level of perfection prior to this lapse prior to this transgression and then through the transgression everything fell apart and and that's where we live now and that's the experience of history this, this brokenness that has okay. fallen away from perfection so you're saying that's not what happened that's not what happened because things were not perfect beforehand meaning Adam and Chava were not perfect before they ate from the Eitz Adas Tovra. What wasn't perfect? When they were placed in Gan Eden, Hashem says, La'ovda ula shamra, you have to cultivate it and you have to guard it. And guarding, our Meforshim imply, is already a susceptibility to failure. If there's no susceptibility to failure, if I'm invincible or all-powerful or, what's or God right. on, my, uh, on my own right, so then what value is there in guarding anything? The implication is that human beings are always already imperfect, not because we failed and not because we didn't do something good enough, but because that's what it means to be a human being. The ultimate ground of, of Jewish spirituality, of, of Kedusha, of Tahara, of, of Kabbalah, is that ultimately we cannot grasp the essence of Hashem. We cannot grasp the essence of anything that Hashem operates with. Our job is to try and come as close as possible to Hashem, but there will always be a gap separating the finite and the infinite or the creation and the creator. And so recognizing that that gap pre-existed our failure is telling us that it was always imperfect. It was never about ultimate unity. It's about trying to find unity in a place of disunity. So instead of yearning to become perfect, it's yearning to come as close to Hashem as we can with our imperfection. And it really changes everything because in one perspective, if perfection is what we're yearning for, then imperfection becomes a malady or it becomes a symptom that needs to be gotten rid of. But if imperfection is the ground where we encounter ourselves, so then we can learn to accept it, cultivate it, love it, and, and serve Hashem through it instead of trying to throw it away and ignore it which I believe is also the birthplace of whatever form of addiction we find ourselves in. And so that's a, such a huge essay. I think so. Yeah. And it's, and it's not like it's hidden, you know, this is what the Ramchal was talking about. This is what the Baal Shem Tov was talking about. This is what the Vilna Gon was talking about. Chazal were, were talking about this, meaning this is what it's, what's in the Psukim. So why do we chase, why do we, when I say we, I mean, I don't know who I'm really referring to. You, you mean you. <laughs> not going to get it. I don't know. Clue <laughs> why, why do people chase perfection? Like it's something that's not attainable yet people will hold themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's a difference. I would say the chase towards perfection that is armed simultaneously with the full acknowledgement that I can't reach perfection. So that's an incredible goal where a person is able to hold two opposites together that I yearn for perfection, yet I am stuck in imperfection. And that pulsation, that movement forward and that ultimate retreat backwards at the very same point is the birthplace of the possibility of humans to become more than they are at the present moment. So yearning for things to be a way that we would like them to be is not the problem. It's not accepting that they can't be the way we want them to be, that's the problem. I think that part of the reason we only yearn for perfection itself is because we have never been taught to accept our failures. We have never been taught to accept the darker parts of ourselves. We have been taught and raised in cultures, whether macro systems or micro systems that value things being incredibly neat and incredibly tidy. And you have to be able to answer questions in a very specific way to be accepted or non-accepted. And I think it's also just a product of late capitalism, you know, in the sense that there's this promise that there's some solution that rests outside of you. And that if you 
buy enough, spend enough, eat enough, devour enough, you know, ingest enough, whatever it is, that you will be able to find that perfect moment. And it's a pipe dream, you know, and I have the the schluss of being able to ask the people in this world who try the biggest substances, you know, these are the people who are, they're, they're not trying to buy the big TVs, right? They're going for the biggest substances in the world, right? The the hardest mind altering chemicals. And they've come to realize that, wow, this, this is not it. There's, there's nothing here. You know, it doesn't provide that feeling that we hoped it would provide. And, and they come to that recognition in a forcible way, but I think we're all kind of stuck on that process a little bit. We'll get right back to this awesome episode, but you know what time it is? It's June now, okay? We're talking about right now in June. And it's not your typical June. I think everyone is walking around with a little bit of a, you know, like... I've been what, congested for the past like three weeks. Th- three weeks? It's been three months. This weather has been absolutely upside down. You, you think, you know, June is supposed to be nice, warm summertime, and we have this weather which is just 45 degrees and 82 degrees. And <laughs> you, know what that ha- you know what that leads to? That leads to being sick. It leads to allergies. The amount of pollen that's floating around in the air. It looks like it's snowing outside. What I is just, happening to this world? I wish, I wish there was a solution the that solution should give is, us yeah. to, to help heal us. I really do. Yeah, and the solution is, is having the best pharmacy in the world in your corner to take care of you when you're not feeling hey, well because mom. you're still a parent or you're still going to school or you're still in medical school, or you still have a job, and you need to get your daily responsibilities done, the last thing you want to be busy with is waiting online in a pharmacy trying to pick up the things that'll make you feel better. Okay. I'm getting upset. No, I, I know, and I hear that, and people send me screenshots of them by, the, I don't know if they're taunting me, but they're by ZBS, and they're like, look how long this line is, and I'm like, ZBS. are you just showing this to me to get me upset? Like, literally, I, I'm week after week, we're keeping telling you about these folks at AMR that they help you cut those lines, not even in half. They literally don't even wait on cut the line it out of your life. It's, they come to you, yeah. they take care of you. They're great. If you can't reach them, they are there the moment. They'll knock next. at your door. They really, they really are. You'll reach them at 848-222-1110. That's 848-222-1110 or AMR Farm. That's P H A R M R X dot com. AMR Farm R X dot com. Make the move today, Yaakov. Yeah. What do we got next? Okay. <laughs> you like start off that sentence. So next is this. I, I This is um, a really beautiful cause that I, I saw. And this is how it starts off. It says, it's the most beautiful problem to have. Basically, in Lakewood, there's Bar Hashem, a booming. There's no time like now in Klal Yisrael where we have so many Yidin, so much Tyra. And obviously, the world's not perfect yet. But that is a fact that is so true. Bar Hashem, I hope... I know Hitler's turning over in his grave by how many of them there are. And they have the best problem that they need more space for their schools. And and particularly um, for this school, they're, they're a Darius Miriam. They're trying to expand their building and make a bigger building for their high school girls. And, and more than that, more than just helping, you know, these are going to be future pillars. And if not already in Kali Yisrael, uh, these women... But also this space that they're trying to raise money for will also host at least 200 weddings a year, which That's is awesome. And it's going to be this. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be nice. And it's going to take care of the girls. It's going to be an environment that really helps them. And they need our help. And if there's a time in Kalali Israel where, you know what? I'm not from Lakewood. You're not from Lakewood. People listening, there's like, listen, I'm not from Jersey. It's not my school. I get a million of these a, a day, a year. But if there's a time to care a little more about Klal Yisrael, it's definitely now and saying, you know what? I don't even personally benefit from this. But you know what? Who who does? My sisters, my brothers in Klal Yisrael. And Hashem, because these are his kids. Yes. They're his kids. They're your siblings. All right. So go give your siblings some support. Head to raise dot it that's r a y z e dot it slash aderes miriam a d e r e s m i r i a m yeah you got it right my spelling teacher that was for you yeah nice you know you told uh, me i was never gonna be able to spell and right, i just Goldgrab did it. happy about that or thank that, you shout out to Goldgrab. no he always no, just gave, hebrew no, he always gave me support and everything best principal ever but you know i'm not gonna spell it again because I, I you know I, it's funny hey, we didn't plan this is the best principal ever are there's so much rooted in which yeshivas and schools we go to, and you could help the people and the the, the students at Adaris Miriam today. So please, shameless, 
Shameless plug. That was great. It was great, yeah, it was right? Okay. Go to Ade- uh, um, what Nahi just said. Uh, <laughs> raise it slash Adaris Miriam. Raise to that it slash Adaris Miriam. We know you hear this a million times, but hopefully it's coming from us and it really helps the students at Adaris Miriam and they're really making this world a better place. Enjoy the rest of this episode. episode. Something you started off when you were getting, I guess, more involved. You gave a whole share on addiction or sheer him on addiction. Right, on the inner world of addiction. Panemius of addiction. Right, on the on the panemius of addiction, on a certain level, the idea was how whether or not a person is an addict or not, we all live within a potential space towards addiction. That it used to be, for example, that if an addict were to walk into my office, meaning with a diagnosis of addiction, a diagnostical statistical manual psychiatric diagnosis, so the question would be, where's the trauma, right? What, what went wrong here that drove this person to where they're at? And Freud himself referred to himself as an archaeologist. He was trying to uncover the hidden histories that gave birth to the sorrid, broken landscape of that person's life. And then slowly but surely, it really came to realize that I don't need to be asking this question. You know, the fact that you're a walking, breathing human being is more than enough of a reason to to be an addict because life is hard for a lot of people. And for a sensitive person, for somebody who is broken or who has not been raised in a way that was fair or they were brought up in whatever type of time period or space. So addiction and trying to self-medicate one's pain is not unreasonable. It's destructive, it's unhealthy, it's maladaptive, it's pathological, but it's not unreasonable. And when we're able to understand the inherent logic in what appears to be illogical, so then we can begin to reflect on it on our own. Very much, I mean, I was also, I was placed in this position of believing very deeply in, in the Baal Shem Tov's teachings, in particular the idea that what one sees in another person is really reflective of what one has within themselves. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe, when he was asked about, you know, Me'echetesi, who says that that's true? And the Lubavitcher Rebbe said that it's a din in hashkacha pratis. It's nothing more, nothing less. A person has to believe that everything they encounter in life is a lesson or an opportunity for them to deepen their understanding. So trying to contemplate, you know, where are these experiences within myself? Uh, you come to realize that you know we're, we're really no different than any other individual who is just trying to find some moment of comfort in a world that very often feels uncomfortable. And just because thankfully by many of us, the, the substances that we try and find comfort in are not destructive, not maladaptive, doesn't mean that we don't live stuck in the same patterns. You, you I'm always curious, I mean, you know, Baruch Hashem, you're not like a heroin addict, but you deal with Hashem. people that are, are addicted to the craziest drugs, as mm-hmm. you just said. What's their experience that you encounter after their, you know, I, I don't know if anyone's ever considered free, mm-hmm. but like after, like w- w- how do they feel? Meaning after getting clean or yeah. after coming down from whatever substance they were using? After getting clean. Curious, I'm curious oh, about you, both. Okay, Nachi wants mm-hmm. both. But we can start after getting clean, sure. I guess. After getting clean, the engine that drives sobriety is hope. The engine that drives it all is hope. And it's very much what Rabbi Nachman announced, that Rabbi Nachman announced two things in his lifetime. He said that it's forbidden to give up hope. And Rabbi Nassim didn't say he screamed it. He just said it's forbidden to give up hope. Forbidden implies that it's something that's possible. You're just not allowed to do it. But then later on in Rabbi Nachman's life, Rabbi Nassim writes as follows. He says, Rabbeinu sha'ag bekol gadol. That Rabbeinu screamed out in a very loud voice. And Rabbi Nassim writes that he spent a lot of time on these words. That ein shum yeyosh ba'olam klal. That hopelessness does not exist. So it's a stira on a certain level. One implies that it exists, but it's not possible. The other says that it doesn't exist at all. And I think that addicts in recovery are a real symbol of that. That even when they thought they lost hope, there's always hope. As long as they're still breathing, there is more right with them than is wrong with them, as John Kabat-Zinn says. And so these people have found this irreducible remainder of light within themselves, of inherent value, beyond any appearances, beyond anything else, and they've decided that I want my life to be better than it is right now. And the only way forward is kind of redirecting that hope that they have within themselves towards the only thing bigger than a drug, which is a higher power, which is spirituality or or what I roughly define as meaning beneath their experiences. So there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of physiological pain. There's detoxing, which is hellish for anybody, you know, depending on their particular substance. It comes with its own economy. Each substance has its own destructive nature. Some can kill you. Some make you want to die. Um, But 
that's the early stage. And then it's very much an up and down slippery slope. It's belief in the self and then overwhelming feelings of powerlessness. But the goal is to try and arm an individual with the tools necessary to regain cognitive control. You know, the biggest secret is that it, it, it simply comes down to what Bob Marley sings in the redemption song, that a person can emancipate themselves from mental slavery for none but themselves can free their mind. In addiction or in any stuckness, a person lives with the assumption that their thoughts are the ruling party in their lives. That if your thoughts tell you something, then they need to be listened to. And if my thought is telling me to do this, I can't break free of it. And what recovery from any destructive behavior or life cycle is, is realizing that, you know, there's something higher than thought. Whether my clients want to call it a soul, a mind, or whether we want to call it the nefesh ruach, neshama chaya, or yechida, you know, it doesn't make much of a difference. It's the higher order of consciousness that actually is stronger than our thoughts. And when they gain that power to speak to their thoughts and say, you know what, I'm done listening to this. You know, I'm done following these negative thoughts. So they free themselves. And then it becomes a daily process, you know, a day by day process. They have to do it one day at a time, one moment at a time. But again, that's no different than what we need to do. We're just not forced to do it. Hmm. It takes us much longer to realize the benefits of that. If they don't do it, they'll fall back into their destructive behaviors. If we don't do it, we'll just be cranky, you know? <laughs> it is Okay, so there's so much that you talk about, but is there a particular topic that you like talking about? Whether, I'm just give you options. Mm -hmm. Is it Shuva? Maybe it's 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 a Yontif, Pesach, or, or uh, Sukkot. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific... Tyra concept that you love talking yeah, about? Yeah, Purim, without a doubt. Purim. Yeah? Yeah, it's always Arkham, been Purim. Arkham Purim. Well, my first, my, my exposure to teaching Torah actually was at something called the University of Purim. Have you guys uh, heard we're about not, this? We're not students there okay. yet. But so, okay, so the person you have to really interview is Isaac, uh, is my friend Isaac, who, who is the dean of the U University of Purim. He lives in Eretz Israel now. It's an actual thing. It's a real thing. It was a group of guys in the Upper West Side. Um, we would gather in someone's apartment um, with a picture of the Baal Shem Tov on his wagon flying into the sky. And there would be some drink and there would be some food. The, and the wagon flying to the sky was after the drink, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> no, it prepared us. It set the, it set the intention. But, um, but so, and one person would prepare Chabura. And that was a stage where I was still in Landers and I had really not been given the opportunity to share Torah before. I was also was in a deep postmodern philosophy stage, so reading a lot of Derrida and Levinas and, and all these different types of thinkers, Maurice Blanchot. I spent a lot of time on these thinkers, which we can come back to after. Um, and then I would also splice together these ideas with poetry and teachings from the Baal Shem Tov, and it was the, the greatest thing in the world. And I first and foremost found my ability to teach Torah there. Um, but it was also, it was all in the context of Purim. It was all in the context of the celebration of Purim and the ideas behind Purim. And what I mean by that is that Purim represents this transvaluation or a reversal of what we would expect. It's the birthplace of laughter. It's the, I know you guys have had a couple of comedy um, classes, <laughs> but, um, but it, it's the incongruity theory of laughter, where what I expect is not what happens, but rather the unexpected kind of tears the scene asunder almost in a traumatic sense and the unexpected appears, which is the laughter of Mashiach, it's the laughter of Vatishak Liyom Acharon, it's the laughter of Yitzchak Avinu, because ostensibly there's nothing funny about Yitzchak. Yitzchak is quiet, he suffers, he's representative of strict judgment and harshness, but at the same point, it's the birthplace of laughter. Because in Yahadus and in Kedusha, when we go deeper into the darkness itself, what we come to find is that there's only light underneath. And that's the light of Venahapochu. It's the light of hopelessness that gives birth to hope. Um, you know, a loss of knowledge for the sake of coming to true awareness that a human being can never truly know anything. And so those ideas have really always and still do permeate um, nearly everything that I try and talk about, as well as Yitzchak Avinu. Yitzchak is kind of my, uh, my, my, my guy, my, my tzaddik. You know, the Chedush Arim asks, he says, what's funny about Yitzchak, right? There's nothing funny about this person. Um, he lived a life of strict judgment. And the Chedush Arim says, whose name was Yitzchak Meir, um, actually, the Chedush Arim says that Yitzchak was brought up to the Akedah and he was shechted. Chazal tell us that his afar is munach al mizbeach, that he died. But at the same point, he walked down the mountain and he was alive. And he said, so what we have is a, an essential paradox of someone who's dead and alive at once. And there's nothing funnier than that. The only thing to do is laugh. And I think that's really instructive as to how we approach, especially Yahadis post-Holocaust, 
you know, and, and kind of our historical moment where we we died, but we're very much alive and, and we're more alive having gone through death than we would have been without death. And so I, I would say that Purim is, is an essential idea. Yeah. We, we usually ask us towards the end and then we still, I think, have a lot more to talk to you about. But I, I, I know this, you're going to have a good answer for this one. If you could meet someone who's no longer alive from history, who would you spend that <laughs> hour with? You know, this will this will sound funny. This will sound funny, but um, in the past, I would have had many different answers, uh, different tzaddikim, Rav Kook, Rabbi Nachman, uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, um, Rabbi Kiva. But as of late, I find myself when I when I daven the first bracha in Shmona Esrei, when I'm thinking about the schus of Avos, I think about my namesake, um, Yoeli Rosenfeld, who was Nehra Gal Kiddush Hashem at the age of 14. And I'm not even sure what I would ask him, um, but part of me feels deeply indebted to him um, because whatever whatever schusim I, I do have to be able to share the Torah of tzaddikim and to share the light of the Torah and the light of the Baal Shem Tov in, in a way that, you know, even one person will, will open up a, a book of teachings from the Baal Shem Tov and realize that it's speaking to them. You know, that's a schus that, that is far beyond anything I've deserved. And, and it's very clear to me that it's a, it's a blood thing. And um, there's no doubt in my mind. There's no doubt in my mind that whatever horrors my, my great uncle was going through, that there was, there was an amuna, uh, no matter what. It's not a doubt in my mind because I, I knew who my Saba was. And, uh, and these were Kedoshim Mamish. So to, to really see that on the ground, to, to understand where the amuna comes from, where that where that amuna in in darkness comes from, which is where my Torah comes from. It's the same teachings. Um, so really, it, to meet him to be makir tov, um, but also to ask just you know, what was your childhood like? You know, what did you find funny? I have no doubt. I know deeply that we were similar. I just don't know how or what. Um, but that that's a, as strange as an answer that sounds. No, that's a really that's beautiful answer. answer. That's the answer. That's really nice. Yeah. You you had mentioned a bunch of deep thinkers before. Yeah. And uh, I'm just curious what what I guess drove you to read their their pieces and because you know I had, I had to read for college I think like Nietzsche and uh, Nietzsche Freud, yeah, meaning the philosophers and, yeah like I sure. but like it didn't interest me at all but sure. it seems like it, it's Absolutely. something that interested you Absolutely um, and it's interesting because I don't really read these things anymore um, I, I don't just because time is of the essence and. I'm such an anxious person that when I read a, a sefer, I need to believe in the neshama of the mechaber who wrote that sefer. So it becomes like a therapy session for me instead of just learning. <laughs> and so I don't find that in, in secular philosophy. Do you like bill yourself? What's that like? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, the one who wrote the book. It's a, running, it's a running tab with the tzaddikim. <laughs> which, uh, that's just I mean, should, should, should be able to pay up. Um, but no, I found a lot of light. My father sent me to Eretz Yisrael um, for Shana Aleph with like Kierkegaard and Camus and Siddhartha, different books, different uh, philosophers, different ideas. And th those kept me in bed for a little bit. My dad sent me with some pretty, you know. <laughs> what was his intention in sending you with those it's books? It's like if I went through this stuff, you got to go through this stuff also. <laughs> Um, what what but, was, um, the, I guess, the result? I mean, the result was just, you know, realizing that, you know, okay, I, I think ultimately unconsciously it was okay. There's there, Life can be either entirely meaningless or meaningful. It's a choice that a person makes, right? There's no inherent value that is explicit in front of a person's eye. It's a bechira at every moment. And therein lies the value of it, to be able to choose meaning over meaninglessness, right? Like the existentialist lived by the banner that existence precedes essence, right? That existence, the bare thisness, the stuff of reality is what comes first. And then essence are our ideas that we project onto reality, you know, are of our own making to serve as comforting blankets. And I was like reading this, I'm like, okay, why is that a problem? You know, so Hashem gave us a Torah to allow us to medicate ourselves against the harshness of this world. That sounds like a really kind God. That sounds like a really nice thing for him to do. So it projected me into this place of choosing meaning over meaninglessness. Um, but those thinkers happened afterwards. It was more when I was in college. Um, these were more or less individuals associated with postmodernism, right? This kind of moment in history where human beings felt that, okay, the structures and the ideas that we have been told for so long to believe in, that we have valued for so long, um, have stuttered. They've broken apart. Cracks have been revealed in their edifices. And 
you know, what are we supposed to do now? Whether it's politic, government, education, organized systems of religiosity in certain situations. And the postmodern thinkers, especially Derrida and the ones who were Jewish, Levinas and, and these guys, had a really courageous response. It was that, okay, let us descend into the rubble of meaning. Let us go into the rubble and to those ruins, you know, where Chazal tell us Elio Anavi hangs out in the ruins of broken houses. And let's rebuild, you know, let's choose to affirm life instead of saying, oh, it's all meaningless. And that gesture, that Bechira, that Becharta Bechayim, that willingness to choose value in the face of the loss of value, to me was the most remarkable and radical idea I had ever encountered. And it was also so similar to what I was reading in the Tzadikim. And so I studied it a lot and I read these texts and I really valued them. And uh, a teacher friend of mine once said that by by people like us, there's no difference between the Mayim El Yonim and the Mayim Tachtonim. So, so my philosophy books, not people like me, people like him, but um, my philosophy books have like all my Ayin Shams and Ayin Shams. And but the the main tool that I learned from them is language. You know the the ability to utilize precise language to convey an idea so that it can be evocative to the human being listening. And I think Rav Cook said that there's no greater Chil Hashem than someone who says a Devar Torah with uh, you know words that can't be fully understood properly. And the Torah deserves a a, a beautiful vessel and language that really conveys what we're trying to say. And so I, I did. I spent a lot of time with those thinkers, and I and I still I still think about them, but I don't read them very much anymore. Do you 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 clearly are a very clever, smart, and person well beyond your years. I I personally thought you're a lot older than you are. I can't believe you're seventeen years old. Um, but but he's older than that. He's eighteen. So um, do you overthink? things and if you do like what do you what do you do to combat that or no like you never feel like you're overthinking stuff i'm an anxious person by nature and anxiety is kind of by definition overthinking but it's not overthinking in a complex way it's thinking the same thought over and over and over again <laughs> but you don't in a thousand different from ways. complex thoughts like you're no, no you know my uh no i i i really don't i don't walk around with a head full of a head full of complexities i don't i i have learned that I have a better memory than I thought I did, you know, so I remember a lot of the texts that I've read and they kind of are hanging out with each other while I'm not even thinking about them so that when I want to develop an idea, they'll kind of already be familiar with each other. If that Pretty makes good sense. skill. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, I have fun listening to when I'm speaking because I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> um, and the cool thing is that I trust what I'm saying. I do. And like we were talking about before, I've also set up a, a system of kind of you know, guards for myself to kind of be on the lookout to tell me the moment that I'm saying something. Yeah, no, that, that was before a, we started. I, I want you to talk right. about that. That you, you have a very close relationship to your to your, to your Rebbe, Rebbe, Rev uh, Moshe Weinberger. Rev Weinberger. Um, Rev Moshe Weinberger. Yeah, Rev Rev Weinberger is certainly somebody who I look up to, um, and I am mevata myself to. You know, I I would if I asked a question and I wanted the answer to be A, and he said that the answer was B, I, w I would follow the answer B, which is for me kind of the the bare level of understanding what a Rebbe is. Um, but Rev Weinberger is a Rebbe in the sense that what I'm trying to do would not be possible without Rev Weinberger. Rev Weinberger taught our generation that we can speak the language of Hasidus, and more importantly, that the Hasidim were speaking to us. The Baal Shem Tov was speaking to us. Um, something amazing that we find in Rebbe Nachman's teachings all the time is Anava Amar, right? Before Rebbe Nassim records a teaching, it's that Rebbe Nachman answered and said, and and it's never clear who what what was he answering? You know, what question? There was no question posed. Why is he opening up with an answer? And I've always thought to myself that it's our questions. You know, it's the questions that would come later on in the generations that Rebbe Nachman and these tzaddikim would be answering. Um, but Baruch Hashem, especially moving out of town, um, I've been able to really force Rev Weinberger, um, whether or not I'm bothering him or not, I don't know, but I don't care either so much. <laughs> um, but I've been able to force him into a position of kind of being there for me and, and kind of really, really being a comforting voice along the path to just get that encouragement from someone whose encouragement I truly believe in. But he's the reason you went to St. Louis, no? Yes. So, uh, well, my wife, uh, oh, okay. my wife, Alana, who's, who's incredible. She She's the one who who let me know about St. Louis. I had never known. She, you know, she's from St. Louis. She's from St. Louis. I knew, I knew New York and I knew Israel or maybe Teaneck, you know, and then there was like Queens somewhere. <laughs> um, but 
we had spent some time in Queens and then, you know, it came time to start thinking about, you know, moving out of a, a tiny apartment. And my wife had brought up St. Louis. And I remember going to Rav Weinberger, um, not even begrudgingly, just kind of open. And Rav Weinberger's answer was a resounding, like, run as fast as you can. Why? Um, I think that he knew me. Um, and I think that out of town Judaism is very different than tri-state Judaism. It's well, a let's, lot. Let's delve into it's that It's a one. lot quieter. It's a lot less... It's it's a lot less materialistic. I don't mean that even on an external level. I mean on an internal level also. There's very much a, a sense of people doing their own thing and nobody really caring about what anybody else is doing. I think that's probably very true here in Tri-State as well, but everyone thinks everybody else cares about what everybody else <laughs> is doing, so it's kind right. of like this echo chamber of sorts. Um, but, but what comes to mind is Ruf Cook has a poem called Merchavim, Merchavim, Expanses, Expanses. And there's just this feeling that no one ever told me that there was, you know, places outside of New York. Um, I also learned to be okay without a restaurant. You know, there's not a single functional restaurant. Um, and, and that became, you know, okay, so I can eat the food in the house right now. And, you know, and, and that was beneficial for me to be able to kind of curb my enthusiasm with regards to seeking out, you know, the wonderful pleasures of, of eating that are available in a place like this. Um, and it also allowed me, I started teaching on Zoom, you know, two years ago because I didn't have a, a potential audience in St. Louis. So that enabled me to kind of really find a space and a voice for, for the Torah that I'm sharing. So I was particularly comfortable with it once everything shut down. Um, but being out of town has been wonderful. Um, whether or not it's the place I'm always going to be, I have no idea. Um, but it also makes coming back to New York more exciting. And, you know, I don't think I would be getting to do things like this had I stayed in New York. That's just my general feeling. I hear you. What's your pet peeve? My pet peeve? It's a great question. I have a lot that I probably can't really speak about without offending a lot of people. Um, my pet peeve? There's not too many things that bother me, really. Um, there are things that I find ugly. There are things that I find abhorrent. There are things that I'm disgusted by, but they don't really bother me about the other person. They're just things that I kind what of are, react to. What are to. some of those things? They all include kind of politic and things like that, which we probably won't won't get too deeply into. Um, I don't like when people are unkind. I don't like when people are manipulated. I don't like seeing people suffer. Um, my not my pet peeve, kind of the thing that breaks me anytime is if a child is is struggling or suffering in a way that that is unfair to them. That's like the one area in therapy that I won't go near. You know, I, I can be compassionate and non-judgmental about nearly everything, but if a child is involved, even in the slightest way, I'm not talking about abject, you know, criminality, but if a child is is being hurt in one way or another, then I, I just can't tolerate it. I'm just very much on the side of vulnerability because it awakens within me a certain sensitivity to myself, this kind of uh, childhood anxiety that I feel still, which is just kind of this powerlessness. So that that I would say is the closest thing to a pet peeve probably. And if people put, you know, sweet potato and chillin. <laughs> what? People do that? I was yeah. by someone, they put chicken yeah. instead of meat. I'm like, yeah. you I want me to go off the dark now? You know, people have done carrots. I've seen it. What? That, that's too far. That's got I I've assume that's a mistake. Funky, I'll tell you something that's funky and, and chillin, that it's okay. Like hot dogs. Like, okay. Yeah, that's like, okay. I'm you, okay you with hot dogs. Hot dogs. It's okay. It's okay. okay. Chicken, no. sweet potato, sweet potato is like, mm -mm. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. and yeah. especially after having kids and baby food, like sweet potatoes is not a not a adult food anymore. I okay, like those two examples that you gave. Going like, too far. Also. That's I don't know. My wife <laughs> might be far. like, yeah, yeah, okay. that's going too far. Your two examples are like, I can't deal with people being mean and cruel to children, and also sweet potato and jolly. Yeah, like those two. Um, uh, yeah, so it's kind of like that. I have a question. Okay, this is a question that like I don't really know. Like we, I remember like stories in camp of like learning the Zohar. You're not ready for it, and. I assume you learn the Zohar, Kabbalah, Kabbalah, like, I, yeah, yeah. You're young. Yeah, learns Kabbalah. Do, you're learning yeah, 33. I you you, yeah, I you learn it, and it says I you do. have to wait till you're 40. So what's yeah? I, what's I the deal? Like, what, what's the deal? Yo, yeah. Shabbat Tzvi came along and made the whole world crazy. That's the first thing. So Judaism had to be protected. The, the teachings of the Arizal were misutilized for whether it was political or even legitimate spiritual causes. And it created a massive rupture, a trauma that, that destroyed nearly a large swath of Judaism. It's 
crazy. And so, and so the rabbis came along and they're like, we really have to protect against this happening again. So there was the development of interdictions or prohibitions against, you know, teaching these teachings in a revealed way. The age of 40 is brought down by specific post skim, whether it's a time where a person is considered to have a well-developed grasp of these ideas or whether it's just assumed that a person will know enough shas then to not want to continue learning it. There was nothing essential about that number that kind of had to do with um, the opening of the books. I mean, there's an idea that when you're 40, you you're grasp bina or understanding, as Chazal tell us, but it was much more of a socio-political decision, not a bad one, one that was necessary. Um, but even more than that, we're sick, you know, we're, we're, we're sick. And, um, and there's a, a teaching from the, the Tzemach, who was one of the, uh, Rav Yaakov Tzemach, who was one of the compilers of the writings of the Arizal. And he writes that these teachings are being revealed specifically in these later generations, talking about even when the Arizal was alive, because it's going to get to a point where it's impossible to function without these teachings. Not that you have to be worthy of understanding these teachings, but rather that these teachings are medicine in and of themselves. And that without these teachings, without an appreciation of what struggle means and what the world is consisting of and what brokenness means and what Hashem wants from us in this world, it's going to be nearly impossible for a person to function because we're going to fall and we're going to think we're lost and we're never going to be able to get up again. But when we can realize that falling is part of the process and that we can always get up again, so these ideas are, are life-giving. You know, the, the Ateres Zvi of Zidichov famously, he wanted young children to be reading the Zohar. And someone came along to him and he said, you know, uh, what about the fact that you can't learn Zohar or the Arizal until you're Tahor? And he's like, what about the fact that you can't be Tahor until you learn the writings of the Arizal hmm. or the Zohar? You know, so, so I think permission has been granted for a number of reasons. And one of the reasons is also that Rav Aaron Halevi of Straselia says that when, when the people are wise enough to understand what's valuable in the king's storehouse, so then the king has to appoint guards because then there's a real risk of him losing his valuable objects. But when the people are unconscious or, or lost in their minds or overwhelmed by their daily struggles, they don't have the wherewithal to look for what's important and what's not important. They're just going to take whatever they take and they're going to walk out, most likely not taking anything of value. And so Rav Aaron Halevi says that that's our generation. You know, we don't know. So we have to gather as much as we can in order to hopefully feel something. I would put a disclaimer. I was saying if someone wants to start learning Zohar, that maybe you should speak to their Rebbe and Rav first. Or I don't know. You tell them, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you know. I don't know, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. My you experience don't from be... this stuff is for like camp stories. That's yeah, what I know. there's a lot of stories about Shiga'on and madness. And it's true on a certain level. Rafroman says a person who learns the Zohar does go mad because it's a maddening world. You know, it's, hmm. it, it's a maddening world and it's hard out there. And the Zohar... Look, the Chazon Ish, the Chavetz Chaim said, learn the Zohar as a Medrash and everybody should be doing that because that's what it is. It's the Medrash of Rashbi. Uh, the words of the Zohar, I believe, are Mikvah Yisrael Hashem. I, I'm, not, I'm not a post I'm certainly not recommending anybody learn anything that the Rebbeim tell them not to learn. But for those out there who don't have a Rebbe that they care to ask or don't value, <laughs> don't value asking such a question, you read the Zohar, you, you buy the Pritzker edition of the Zohar and, and you see the beautiful poetic expressions of spirituality and the the sense of nighttime. I mean, the Zohar is just a bunch of Chevra, the Chavraya and friends walking in northern Israel in the dark of night with sounds coming out of the mountains, with fear, with excitement, with friendship and companionship and, and just a, a, a real sense that every single moment, every single word offers infinite storehouses of spiritual potential. That's what the Zohar is teaching. You're great at marketing, by the you way. Know, the Zohar <laughs> opens a person up. The Zohar is a mikvah. The Ramchal says that the whole world is a mabul, and the Zohar is a book that is like a teva. It saves you from the mabul. And it's not only the Zohar, it's the Gemara, it's, it's learning any word of Torah. The Zohar is just like more explicit in it. Hmm. Because the Zohar is really not, you know, the Zohar is not some textual manual telling you how to build a golem or anything like that. Mm. You know, it, it's very much interpretations of psukim. Love and connection is the underlying theme the underlying theme, and the ability to connect to Hashem in this world, to taste Olam Haba in this world, to find the moment of being okay. That's what the Zohar is about. It's about light. It's about a shine in this world. Yaakov, we're going to start a Zohar Chabura. Uh, <laughs> Look, if that's, you know, if anybody decides to learn the Zohar as a result of this uh, <laughs> podcast, then it's it's more than worth it. So, <laughs> so we, we, we end off with a, a few types of questions. So the first question we're going to ask 
you is uh, what's the best advice you've ever received? To learn the it's a great question. <laughs> no, it's a great question. It's a great question. I'll give two if that's okay. Um, clinically, when I was doing my second year of practicum in a Bronx correctional facility associated rehab, um, and I was kind of wearing my white shirt, black pants, sit this out, black yarmulke, and my supervisor was a secular Jew, a, a real kind of thinker, real interest in psychoanalysis. And I asked her, I said, should I wear my tzitzis out and my yarmulke? And she said, when people see you, they're going to see three things. They're going to see suffering, survival, and faith. And she said, utilize it as your weapon. And since then, I don't think there's been a day of clinical work in my job that I haven't worn my tzitzis out. Um, I have never been asked anything negative about it. I develop different answers all the time when people ask me what the strings are. I had a client interrupt another client and say, don't bother him, they're his antennas. So, um, yeah. so that was one, to own my posture, to own my space, to own where I come from and, and the faith that's in my blood and to share it with other people as opposed to be afraid of other people seeing it. And then the one year that I was Zohar to go to Uman for Rosh Hashanah, I don't remember exactly what the conversation was, but I was talking to an elderly Breslover Chassid who was uh, just an incredible, incredible person. Um, someone who was close to throw by Judah Michelle, actually. Um, and I, I don't remember what I was complaining about, but it was probably something that I typically complain about. And his response was to the question of, of struggle or something. He says, Eneni mevin. I don't understand. Bein kach u bein kach in lecha klum. Either way, you don't have anything of your own. That was his answer. He said, whether you believe in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you don't have anything. And if you struggle with believing in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you don't have anything. And that recognition of, of Bein Kach U Bein Kach, kind of like we were talking about before, that no matter which way you slice it, you know, this world is only about Bittal. It's only about self-nullification. And you might as well do it with Hashem. You know, I've always said that the biggest atheist in the room and the most religious person in the room will both shake hands on the shared recognition that we are not in control of anything other mm -hmm. than our thoughts. And so, ben kachu ben kachin lechaklum. That was a, a really good piece of information. And uh, also, keep snacks in your car for, for anyone married. Keep snacks in your car so that you're not hungry when you go home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. That's good also. Yeah. Especially if there's no restaurants. You yeah. know, you got to exactly. really be prepared. <laughs> exactly. But there's 613 mitzvahs. So is there any specific particular mitzvah that you connect with more than all the others? I think Pidyon Petar Hamor. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say Kiddush on Friday night. I okay. would say Kiddush on Friday night. Um, because the transitionary period of Friday night where a person kind of just slightly escapes the, the harrowing, you know, landscape of the week, like Hasidim say Hodu, um, on, after Mincha. Hodu is basically where we learn, uh, how to make a Birchas Gomel from. Basic recognition is, whoa, Hashem, that was wacky. You know, I almost died a thousand different ways, spiritually, physically. Now I'm here to thank you for giving me Shabbos. And then the koshel kiddush, I remember growing up and my father would always look into the wine and that was the minhag of my saba as well. And the more and more I understood the mitzvah, or thought I understood the mitzvah, the idea that spoke to me so deeply is as follows, that the kiddush cup and the wine in the kiddush cup is referred to in the Zohar HaKadosh as ulamta shapirta deles ba'inen, a, a beautiful maiden without eyes. It's a beautiful, beautiful person, but there's no eyes to it. And that when we gaze into the cup and we look at the blackness of the wine and what appears to be without meaning or without purpose, and we allow our eyes to become the illumination of that cup. And, and so on Shabbos, our eyes are opened enough to see the light of the world. And that moment of Kiddush is always a, a transitionary period where, you know, whatever happened stops and, and you're now in Shabbos. And that's why, you know, we say Tzaytzchem L'Shalom before Kiddush because Malachim can't, Malachim can't handle such a thing. Malachim can't understand such a holy thing to, to find light within the darkness of this world. So that, that Kos Chel Kiddush, which is just the real announcement of, you know, that Seichel HaMasa Barishas. Yeah, it doesn't look sometimes like Hashem created the world, but, but we remember that Hashem created the world, and for the next 24 or 36 hours, we're going to act like Hashem created the world. And so I would say that Kiddush is my favorite mitzvah. Is there any last piece or idea or story or concept that you'd like to share with the people listening to this podcast? 
Yeah, the Iker idea is that the goal of everything is to be okay in the moment, is to not wait till after this lifetime to be okay, but rather to find moments of being okay right now. Like Chazal would say to each other before they took leave, they would say, you should see your life in your days, meaning you should taste Olam Haba in this world. And the Zohar refers to Olam Haba as Alma Asi, the world that is perpetually arriving into our minds at every moment. And we just have to open ourselves up enough to see it. And I think the, the most significant story is that Rabbi Nassim once asked Rabbi Nachman, he says, what's the most important thing that you do? What's the most spiritually illuminating thing that you do? And Rabbi Nachman, without batting an eye, said, whatever I'm doing right now. And so if we can tap into that, you know, I know you had Benji Epstein on here, so <laughs> a, a real plug for his book, Living in the Presence. It's a tremendous guide for, for what, what we can really cultivate with mindfulness. Oh, he's going to love and, you. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I, I love him very much. So, um, so yeah, I would say to, to learn how to be present, you know, because otherwise it, it goes way too fast and, and we lose sight of it all. So making sure that there's moments of, of presence and, and reading Where the Wild Things Are to Your Kids is, is something I would say also. I love <laughs> that book very much. That's a good book. <laughs> that longing that it cultivates, just a, a desire to love a moment so much that you say, please don't go, please don't go, I'll eat you up, I love you so, I think is really... The crux of what Shira Shirim is about. So those two things. Where, where can people find, I guess, more of your Shirim? Or... So I have a, a lot, Baruch Hashem. I have a dear friend, Zach Hamanitz, who made a podcast for me. It's called Inward with Rabbi Joey Rosenfeld. And there's been, I think, 10 series of Shirim. I, I did Rav Kook and the Leshem and, and Addiction and Radzin and the Sviros and, uh, and Hope and Shabbos and Rabbi Nachman. And now I'm doing Shirim on Anxiety. And then I post everything on Twitter or Facebook. And Meaningful Minute, uh, the Meaningful Minute app. You know, there's mm. a lot of Torah on there as well. All right. That's well, nice. people can find you, specifically on Twitter. You do an incredible job. And, of course, the app. Uh, thank you so much for coming in. And I hope, hope one day we'll, we'll be able to go out round two. Amen. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Meaningful PayPal Podcast. I that, sure did. That was Rabbi Joe Rosenfeld. You know, folks. we had this conversation such a long time ago. And like Bar Hashem, we, we have like, I don't know, like 12, 13 episodes lined up to go. I, I need to re-listen to this episode. Yeah. Well, you mean you just re-listened to it because it just happened. It just happened. But honestly, we weren't listening. We were talking no, to, on it. No, what do you mean? The whole time they were listening, we were sitting <laughs> We were listening here. along. We were sitting here. So then at what point are we listening to this? Now? It's sort of like when they say like everything, you know, your babe say like everything that happens already happened. It's like DVR, right? This conversation is, is so apropos for being on with Joey's episode. I know. No? This I is know. like perfect. Fellas, lads, go check him out on Twitter. Yeah, he's good stuff. And, I've been Joey Roosevelt. And also, if you could take 30 seconds to maybe 95 seconds, if you haven't yet, and leave us a nice positive review on Apple Podcasts, it would mean the world to us. And Nachi and I go through it every night before we go to sleep and we're like, oh, did we get another one? Oh, we read no, it to no our one. children. Yeah. It's no. bedtime stories. <laughs> our children have very boring stories. No, but we really love the reviews and it, we really appreciate them. So enjoy the rest of your week. I have to bring back, remember I said each time I'm going to end off yeah. with thing. So um, get more into the Tyra. That was, that was just, that was so awkward though. Okay. Drive drive safely when it's foggy outside. Ciao.